All right, welcome everybody. It's great to be back. A lot of uh, good things to talk about, some not so good. We're going to be going over uh, so much took place, indictments, rallies, so many different things during our uh, vacation. But where I want to start is with the latest on COVID cases and deaths. We're going to do a deeper dive tomorrow about what's going on on a state by state basis. But what is increasingly happening is that this pandemic is becoming essentially a red state, blue state pandemic. We now have different enough vaccination rates in states like Hawaii, uh, Vermont, Massachusetts and others compared to places like Mississippi, in particular, Alabama, Arkansas, that this Delta variant is wreaking uh, drastically different levels of havoc in the more vaccinated states versus in the less vaccinated states. And the difference is only going to grow due to the level of contagion of this Delta variant uh, believed to be um, reproducing and are not somewhere between five and eight. The Delta variant, which is m significantly more contagious than the sort of original strain of the coronavirus, believed to be somewhere in the you know two to four, two and a half to three and a half range. And this this is not merely a curiosity. It's actually having uh, a real impact. And there's a new Associated Press report that nearly all covid deaths are now among the unvaccinated. The, the numbers are just incredible. Um, the Associated Press writing nearly all covid deaths in the U.S. are now in people who aren't vaccinated a staggering demonstration of how effective the shots have been and an indication that deaths per day now under 300 could be practically zero if everyone eligible got the vaccine. An associated press analysis of available government data from May shows that breakthrough infections in fully vaccinated people accounted for fewer than twelve hundred of more than one hundred and seven thousand hospitalizations. So that means of those hospitalized um, one point one percent were vaccinated compared to ninety eight point nine percent of hospitalizations being in those who were not vaccinated. And then further, um, only about one hundred and fifty of the more than eighteen thousand covid deaths in May were in fully vaccinated people. That translates to about zero point eight percent or five deaths per day on average. Um, only about 45 states report breakthrough infections. Some are more aggressive than others in looking for such cases. So the data probably understates such infections. So there's a few important details here to consider. One is at this point, there's just no question whatsoever about the level of protection that the vaccines provide, including against the Delta variant. Um, some might say, well, you could get sick anyway and you could end up in the hospital and you could die. And of course, that's true. Uh, but often the people saying that are those who don't want to get vaccinated, seemingly failing to understand that by they themselves getting vaccinated, they become less likely to pass on any of these variants to someone who has been vaccinated, but might be in the eight or so percent that has not developed antibodies. Now, one other thing, and we're going to look into this in more detail tomorrow. There's a I don't even know about a report that there's there's we'll call it a report. It's not a, it's not a study, but there is a news report out of Israel, a highly vaccinated country that they believe there may only be 64 percent protection against the Delta variant for the Pfizer vaccine. Remember that Israel started vaccinating very early exclusively with the Pfizer vaccine or at least initially exclusively with the Pfizer vaccine. And of course, when you see that and you say, oh, it was 92 percent, only 64 percent effective against the Delta variant. Some good epidemiologists, including uh, Dr. Ashish Jha, who we had on the show a couple of weeks ago and others have said they as of now are unsure about that 64 percent number and sort of a two two uh, pronged response. One, we don't really know that that's the number and it sounds suspiciously low. It's probably higher than that, but lower than 92 percent. But more importantly, um, even though cases have started to tick back up in Israel as the Delta variant spreads, hospitalizations for now are at least not up. And that would be the vaccine doing its job, which is preventing serious illness, preventing hospitalization and ultimately preventing death. So what, regardless of your view as to the seriousness of that variant, 
it still makes sense to just go and get vaccinated because not only do you protect yourself, you also protect people that may be vaccinated, but either immunocompromised or just in that that, you know, it's on a bell curve. Uh, antibody development is on a bell curve and not everybody develops those antibodies. Um, the uh, oh, one other thing there are immediately there are always conspiracy theorists and I've seen floating around. Oh, the people who were vaccinated and died died from the vaccine. And of course, there's no evidence of that whatsoever. Uh, the vast majority of those folks were vaccinated, you know, months, months before. In many cases, the, the, there's no evidence of that. But remember that that's how conspiracism works. And it should be no surprise that that's uh, the, the way that some people are going to react. Uh, I got an email from an ER doctor um, who works in a less vaccinated red state. And he said they are regularly seeing at their hospital that just like the national data, almost everybody who's being hospitalized and even more so almost everybody who's dying of the virus was not vaccinated. And it, he said, you know, I, I understand that it's easy not to feel sympathy for some of these folks in some sense. I mean, listen, they didn't get vaccinated. They could have. They got sick. Then they died. Uh, but he had a different take, which I think is is reasonably empathetic, which is they fell for disinformation. And in a sense, we we should we should sympathize with that. Uh, they didn't get vaccinated because they became convinced of things that weren't true. They were victimized by purveyors of of disinformation. And societally, there is some responsibility to that. I, I, I get that on the bonus show today. I'm going to tell the story um, from last week from my trip of a Lyft driver who told me he wasn't getting vaccinated because his mom became magnetic after getting the second dose. So that'll be on today's bonus show. But um, stunning, stunning stuff. We had the Fourth of July weekend uh, in the United States, a uh, big holiday weekend, lots of uh, fireworks, which I can really do without and um, uh, cookouts and, and all sorts of different things. Uh, but we also had an unconscionable number of shootings. And very often this doesn't get news. I will sometimes come to you and say, hey, you know, we had 15 shootings over the weekend and 70 people died and individually none of these made any headlines. And part of that fact that that is both evidence that um we are incredibly uh, increasingly desensitized to the fact that this is just a regular part of living in the United States. And also because increasingly shootings don't make headlines, it's less present in terms of advocating for gun safety uh, regulation and laws, et cetera. Look at these numbers. There's a CNN report from last night which says at least 150 people fatally shot in more than 400 shootings over the 4th of July weekend. These numbers are now out of date. And I actually went to the gun violence archive, which you can find at gunviolencearchive.org. And I just started counting. And as you can see, pages and pages of July 5th shootings. And with any single one of these, you can click on it and get more information. I mean, just randomly, uh, you know, look at this shooting in South Carolina, uh, Denmark, South Carolina, where one person was killed, uh, multiple shootings in Greensboro, North Carolina, with people injured. And you just scroll by and the second page. It's all July 5th shootings. The third page is all July 5th shootings. The fourth page is all July 5th shootings. And you just keep going. Eventually, you get to shootings on July 4th, but it's just pages and pages. And every single one of these could be a news story. We're still on July 5th. Uh, 192 people killed in 562 shootings over the weekend. Now, I'm, I'm just talking about Saturday, July 3rd, Sunday, July 4th and Monday, July 5th. There's already been shootings this morning. There's, there was one in Atlanta and, and a couple of others. Um, uh, if you go back further into Friday, there were shootings on that day. Think about these numbers, 562 shootings on just July three, four and five and one hundred and ninety two people killed. Um, CNN reporting some of the details from from some of these, um, at least. And again, remember, this this was from last night. So this these numbers have been updated. At least one hundred and fifty people were killed by gun violence in more than 400 shootings across the country during the Fourth of July weekend. 
uh, as cities nationwide confront a surge in violent crime. The data, which includes the number of shooting incidents and gun violence victims nationally over a 72 hour period from Friday to Sunday, is still evolving and will be updated in New York, where gun violence has been rising to levels not seen in years. There were 26 victims from 21 shootings. Uh, and you can just go and look at whatever city is interesting to you in Chicago. 83 people shot, including 14 killed. Now, the article accurately points out that gun violence and violence in general has been up over the last year. This is something we've talked about before, and it's really important not to get sucked into the disinformation about this. Uh, Republicans who were silent about mass shootings during the Trump administration, except in very narrow cases where the identity of either the shooter or the victim was advantageous to them politically. Those people are now saying uh, it's violence everywhere under Joe Biden. That's that's really all they care about, making a political point. Uh, my suggestion is to, number one, zoom out a little bit and understand that over a 20 year period, over a 30 year period, violent crime in the U.S., generally speaking, is down. Uh, we have a very specific problem in the United States. It's a unique problem globally when it comes to gun violence. There is a preponderance of both f firearm ownership as well as availability of firearms in the United States. That is not the case in just about any other developed country. And in addition to that, there's a cultural problem that we've talked about. I don't want to rehash that right now because what is missing from I hesitate to even call it an analysis, but what's missing from the talking points from the right about violent crime is up in Trump in, in Biden's America. A few things are missing from that. Number one, uh, violent crime was up uh, during 2020 uh, during the pandemic and Donald Trump was president at the time. And then instead of blaming the president, they were blaming so -ca so-called Democrat mayors in blue cities. So number one, it's very transparent that no matter who's in power, they will find Democrats to blame. And then the truth is that this is a far more complicated thing than there is a Democrat in the White House or a Republican in the White House. It's far more complicated than the mayor or the governor is a Republican or a Democrat. Um, this relates to economic issues. This relates to uh, instability uh, more broadly of our economic system exacerbated by the pandemic and what is definitely a K-shaped recovery, where those that have done well have done really well as we have started to recover from the pandemic and others have been completely left behind. So the, the point here is not to relitigate every aspect of uh, uh, so-called violent Democrat cities, which we've debunked, or of the fact that the crime increases actually started in 2020 when it wasn't Joe Biden that was president, it was Donald Trump. It's that you, as hopefully a savvy new consumer, a uh, news consumer, when you hear these talking points, I'm, my hope is your reaction would not only be, is the talking point accurate or not, but a slight zoom out where you say, is this even the right conversation to be having about this issue? Because often it's not. They want us to be having the conversations that are advantageous to them. Uh, and they leave out completely, in this case, for example, the economic conversation. The violence started going up under Trump in 2020. It's continued going up under Joe Biden in some cities in 2021. One was a Republican, one's a Democrat. Let's argue about that is what they want, when in reality, the conversation we should be having is a different one. We'll continue tracking these numbers and they're very ugly, but I would love to hear from you about what else you believe is causing this uptick. You can find me on Twitter at Pacman. Don't forget that the best way to support the David Pakman show is by becoming a member, which gives you access to the daily bonus show, the regular show with no commercials. You also get access to our entire archive of every episode dating back a really long time and plenty of other awesome membership perks. Go to joinpacman.com and use the coupon code better 21 for a huge discount. Joinpacman.com. Remember that we do depend on your support to fund our program. You can sign up for a membership today at uh, joinpacman.com. I have uh, I had a, a two actually pretty big uh, vaccine anti-vax run-ins during my vacation. I'm going to talk about them on today's bonus show. Pat will tell us what he was up to. Um, sign up right now at joinpacman.com and you can use the coupon code INDICTMENT21. 
if you would like, as we, I guess we're sort of celebrating the indictment on 15 felony counts of Donald Trump's CFO. It's starting to all come off the walls and we'll get to that later. Joinpacman.com is the place where you can sign up. Okay. So Donald Trump had another one of these rallies that he has restarted over the 4th of July weekend. I covered it live and tomorrow, actually, hopefully later today, I'm going to lay out what I think, uh, will happen if Donald Trump does indeed run in 2024. I happen to think that Joe and Kamala are in real trouble if Trump runs in 24. I I know that there are some in the audience who disagree with me and some that vehemently, vehemently uh, do agree. We'll get to that later. But in terms of the rallies themselves, they're truly horrifying. I mean, every time I cover one of these rallies, I get dozens of emails, especially from foreign viewers saying, David, what is happening in the United States? Uh, These rallies are dangerous. This one was in Florida. Trump admitting to crimes during them, by the way, we'll get to that, Uh, of course, telling completely corrosive, easily debunkable lies about American democracy and the crowd. It it's it's not even notable to say the crowd believes it. There's not even the possibility that the crowd might question anything they're told at these rallies. And that's very scary. Does the crowd have what we would call an illness. I'm increasingly unsure what we even call what these folks are suffering from. So let's just start with Trump confessing to crimes during the speech, Trump's business, his organization and Trump's CFO, Alan Weissel- Weisselberg, have been indicted. Part of these charges uh, relate to allegedly avoiding taxes by having Donald Trump directly pay for stuff for his CFO. Uh, over a 15 year period, tons of stuff, tons of money. And Trump admits, even if only to part of the stuff, saying not paying taxes on your company car or your grandkids education. The allegation is Trump would directly pay for Weisselberg's grandkids educations, which really should be income Weisselberg pays tax on. And he's accused of not paying tax on that. That's what they're accused of. And Trump's admitting it here. Take a look at this. And yet they go after good, hardworking people for not paying taxes on a company car. Company car. You didn't pay tax on the car or a company apartment. You used an apartment because you need an apartment because you have to travel too far where your house is and didn't pay tax or education for your grandchildren. I don't even know. Do you have to? But does anybody know the answer to that stuff? Okay. so Trump admitting to it and the crowd barely has any idea what Trump is even talking about. But Trump is confessing to the crimes that they have been charged with in this case. This actually helps him and his followers if he just admits to it in public. This has been a strategy for a long time. You admit to it in public. Trump says it definitely shouldn't be illegal. The fact that there is a law against this is me being a victim of something. And his followers just get on his side 110 percent, even though he's admitting to crimes when others say, listen, Okay, drugs, fine, but that really shouldn't be a crime. These law and order right wingers say, but it is. And law and order means if something's a crime, you have to be punished for it. When Trump says, is this stuff even a crime? It shouldn't be a crime. Then they're with him 100 percent. And Trump even pointing out during this speech the strategy that he uses. If you keep repeating lies to your followers, your followers will start to believe them. Trump talks about it as if it's Uh, applicable to Democrats, but it's actually exactly what he does. Take a look at this. All of a sudden they said today I heard and there's a word disinformation It's called this. If you say it enough and keep saying it, just keep saying they'll start to believe you. We can't let that happen because now they're saying the Republicans wanted to to defund the police. I said, you know, this is why half or more of Trump's followers still to this day believe that he won the 2020 election because Trump and others keep repeating it. Trump then paints himself as a victim, if you can believe it. And he brings up Hillary Clinton. Yeah, it's 2021. We're halfway through 2021. He's bringing up Hillary Clinton stuff from 2015 and and earlier. Look at this from Ukraine, from China. They didn't go after Hillary Clinton and her foundation. They didn't touch her. They leave Democrats alone, no matter how bad they are. 
But they've mobilized every power of government to come after me, my family, my wonderful employees and my company solely because of politics. So Trump, as usual, the biggest victim of anybody you'll see later in the show, his children also painting themselves as just the perpetual endless victims. Now, then it goes totally off the rails. Trump gets back on the statues stuff and he claims without any evidence that Democrats want to replace the Jefferson Memorial with a statue of Al Sharpton, which is baseless. First of all, it strikes me as probably racist in some way, uh, although I'm I'm trying to figure out exactly all of the ways in which it is. Uh, Take a look at this clip. Uh, They want to take the statue of Thomas Jefferson out and replace it with somebody. By the way, let me tell you, you're not going to be happy with the person they want to replace him with. Ladies and gentlemen, Thomas Jefferson is being removed from the Jefferson Memorial and being replaced with the Reverend Al Sharpton. Um, I don't think so. So it's also really stupid. I mean, I, I wouldn't want an Al Sharpton statue replacing the Jefferson Memorial and I'm on the left. So it's just like layers upon layers of dumb gaslighting. And then, of course, no Trump rally is complete without the slurring part of the evening. I won't spend a lot of time on this. The speech went nearly two hours, clearly way too long for Trump. And as the sweat poured, the slurring ramped up. Here's uh, Trump saying that our ancestors crust. They crust fascism. Take a look. Our ancestors crushed, just absolutely crushed fascism beneath the weight. So an absolutely absurd event. These apparently are going to continue. I think that this is part of Trump's plan to build himself up and build up his influence going into 2022. And because, you know, normally I won't talk about an election that's not the next one. But I'm actually going to break my own rule later on in today's show, because what Trump is doing now is as much about 2024 as it is about 2022. And you really can't talk about one without talking about the other. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But next, what I want to go to is to show you some interviews with Trump supporters that went to this rally in Sarasota, Florida, which is arguably even scarier than than the things Trump said himself. So let's get to that next. So, okay. Trump does his rally in Florida. It's riddled with lies. It's pathetic. It's authoritarian. It's hypocritical. Fine in the sense that it's what we've come to expect and what we've come to know. But understand that without Trump supporters who are willing to stand around for 12 hours waiting for the rally uh, and are willing to it's not even take in and accept it's there's not even the possibility that they would question any of the things that Donald Trump says during these rallies. Without those people, there really is no rally. It's just Trump speaking to an empty room. So let's look at some Trump supporter interviews from the rally in Sarasota, Florida. And this is going to set us up for our conversation that I'll be having after the break about why I believe that if Donald Trump does run in 2024, um, it's not good at all for the Biden Harris ticket. I think Biden Harris are in real trouble if Trump runs. We're going to get to that. Okay, but first, Trump supporters. Here's one being interviewed by Real America's Voice and check out its. We've talked about delusional before. This is not just delusional. This is a sort of defiant and proud delusion that is different than a lot of what we've seen prior to the Trumpian era. Take a look at this supporter, a Trump supporter. Why are you continuing to support the president so aggressively and passionately still right now in 2021? And this is a key. Why is this a key question? I mean, the, the, you know, real America's voice, these people, this is all terrible. But why is this a key question? Because if we want to figure out what 22 and 24 will likely look like, this is the perfect question. Why are you still supporting this guy so aggressively? He lost everything for you. He lost 18 in 18. He lost the house for you. In 20, he lost the White House and the Senate. Well, but they don't even believe that. That's the key. Because he really won the election. He loves our country. He loves our veterans. Um, He wants. There it is. There it is. Uncritically accepting. There's not even a chance she wouldn't accept it. Trump's the Trump's the president right now. That's why I support him, she says. 
safe borders and he's our president and I just love him because he loves America so much. He stands for everything America is. And, he- and understand that this no, no particular offense to this woman. This is just Trump. Trump, as a privileged New York City born and raised guy, has spent his life trying to stay away from uh, w- women like this woman. I'm not p- picking on her in particular. I mean, it applies to everybody, right? The workers actually doing the work, building Trump's real estate projects, the people donating to Trump's campaign. All of these people are useful and valuable to Trump only as far as uh, they can they can uh, assist him in whatever his immediate goals are. He wants nothing to do with these people in reality. He's not racist like they say he is. And um, I love him. That's why God, too. I mean, and great people like you guys that bring us together and tell us the real truth. I wish more people were watching and hearing the real truth. Yeah. So there's just not, you know, the language that's being used, that is cult language. That is cult language. And, you know, we've um, if you want more sort of texture to understand that language and these ideologies, check out the interview I did with Stephen Hassan about cultishness. Read The Road to Jonestown about Jim Jones People's uh, Temple. I'm now reading Going Clear by Lawrence Wright about Scientology it's Trumpism. It's Trumpism. That's what it is when you when you read it and and you then see these people. That's what it is. Let's go to another one of these. This one now is from Newsmax. Uh, these are more interviews with Trump supporters at the rally. Horrible. Always love, love Trump. I think he's the best thing that happened to our country, and now it's being destroyed. What makes you love Trump so much? Free enterprise system. You know, it's all about free enterprise system and the Second Amendment. And I'm, we're all pro cops, of course. And understand if you actually say to these folks, what did Trump do on Second Amendment? And then what did Biden do that is so restricting your ability to own guns? I guarantee you they will not actually be able to name anything Trump actually did on firearms. He actually did very little. It was mostly rhetoric. And with Biden, they also will be unable to name anything. Now, Biden has tried to do a couple of things. They're all totally milk toast, uh, establishing a commission to study X and uh, buckling down a little bit on, on ghost gun sales, which is not, you know, it's, it's a problem, but it's not going to restrict in all likelihood that guy's ability to get guns. It's just made up. It's, there's nothing there. There's still a lot of great patriots in this country, and we're not going to let the left take it from us. If this becomes socialism, where in the world? Will we go? And, we- and again, so this is the effectiveness of propaganda. What's socialism? What are you talking about? Give us an example. I mean, listen, when I when Jesse Lee Peterson interviewed me, this prominent sort of prominent cartoonishly uh, uh, prominent black conservative, and he said socialism, socialism. I said, what's an example of socialism under Obama? He said, what about those Obama phones? That's what he was able to come up with. There's no substance here. I want to keep socialism um, away from the United States. Oh, I'm here because the country is not going in the right direction. How so? And I will let you know that I was a registered Democrat since 1976. Can you tell me a little bit about your message? Fight terrorism, support Israel. Yeah, it's really very simple. Uh, we have a threat from people screaming death to America, death to Israel. Same group, same insanity. These, I, these people are so gross. Like their their quote support of Israel is just it's it's disgustingly misplaced. And if we don't fight back, we show our weakness. I'm here to show that people still love him even when he's so far in retirement. But we'll see what happens. The uh, journey isn't over. It's just beginning. Uh, we have the opportunity to uh, to make America great again. We hit a bump in the road. We got knocked. Up. Australian guy apparently loves Trump over by the election by COVID. But we're going to come back. We can come back stronger than ever. Why is Trump having a rally when there's three and a half more years until he's he can run? And I said, it's about hope. It's awesome. And the the vibe here is so great and everybody's so positive and everybody's so excited. There is a hope for America. There's a hope for our future. So that is uh, that that is that. And so after the break, I'm going to explain to you why I believe if Trump runs in 24, Joe and Kamala are in trouble. We'll have more clips from this event. Um, on our Instagram, which you can find at David Pakman show. Follow me on Instagram at David Pakman. See pictures from my recent uh, escapades, which I'll talk about more on today's bonus show. If you value what we do at the David Pakman show, remember to support us on Patreon. 
Go to patreon.com slash David Pakman show where you can get access to behind the scenes videos, the daily bonus show, the commercial free daily show, as well as special discounts on merch, including hats, hoodies, mugs and T-shirts. You can support the show for as little as two dollars a month. Check it out at patreon.com slash David Pakman show. OK, so I, I want to lay this out now just to get it on the record relatively early. Normally, I don't comment about an election that's not the immediate next election. So in 2017, people would call in and they'd say, hey, what do you think about 2020, this, that? And I'd say we have to focus on 2018. That's the immediate question right now. What happens in 2018? But I actually do want to talk about 2024 today a little bit because I worry that there's lots of people just missing what's taking place and not seeing what is increasingly a very disturbing situation. The bottom line is this. I believe that if there's a so-called rematch in 24 between Trump and Biden, that that's very, very bad for Joe Biden. I don't think that looks good. And if Joe Biden chooses not to run for reelection uh, and uh, it is Kamala Harris instead, who is the Democratic presidential nominee. I think that that also doesn't look very good, and I'm going to lay out why. Now, I'm going to mention Joe Biden's age here. Joe Biden would be 82 at the time of the 2024 election. Donald Trump would also be 78 at that time. And one might argue there's really not that much difference. It's just two old white guys. But the difference is that Donald Trump has a cult of followers, a cult of personality around him that afflicts his supporters for whom Trump's age is not going to be a factor. While I believe that because of the nature of Joe Biden's support and because of the nature, particularly of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party and the preferences of Democratic voters, the idea of voting for an 82 year old in 2024 is going to impact those more predisposed to vote for Joe Biden than it will affect those likely or considering voting for Donald Trump in 2024. So in other words, what I'm saying is Biden's age will work against him more than Trump's age will work against Trump. So let's now get into my thought process. First and foremost, I'm getting the sense just at a base level that in general, a so-called rematch is going to be very tough for Joe Biden. And in addition to the concept of a rematch, uh, or one of our Reddit viewers uh, put, put put a post up on our Reddit that calls it like a sort of final showdown. I think that it will invigorate the right far more than it will invigorate the left. That's one scenario. The final showdown rematch between Trump and Biden. I don't think it's very good for Joe Biden. Now, there's a different scenario that's possible, which is that Joe Biden, as some suspect, might not run for a second term in 2024. And then Kamala Harris will either be handed or might have to fight for the Democratic nomination. There's still a long time until 2024, but all of those scenarios, I think, are also problematic. Kamala Harris has maintained a relatively low profile so far, uh, and she has low approval ratings. That doesn't give me much confidence about Harris versus Trump in 2024. If you look at the latest Real Clear Politics average of approval polls, Kamala Harris is now underwater. Her negatives, her disapproval is higher than her approval. For better or worse, she's taken some real hits when it comes to her handling of the border. Now, you might say what handling rightly or wrongly, Joe Biden tasked her with the border problem. Her approval on that is very low. Now, it's early. Things could change between now and 2024. But as of right now, I am not at all confident that if Kamala Harris is just handed the Democratic nomination, meaning Biden says, I'm not running, but Kamala Harris is running and no serious Democratic primary takes place and she's the nominee. I don't think Harris does well against Donald Trump in 2024. In fact, I find it really difficult to see a scenario where she wins. Now, the other scenario would be Joe Biden says he's not running and Harris does run. But there's a big primary fight which Kamala Harris ultimately wins because of her low approval. If Kamala Harris has to fight her way through an ugly primary to get that nomination, it also strikes me as a recipe for disaster similar to 2016. The third scenario would be Biden doesn't run. Kamala fights for the nomination, but she loses and someone else is the Democratic nominee. That I do think is too early to talk about. And we, we just have no idea who that might be. We have no idea how they might match up against Donald. Trump. It's just too hypothetical. But the two scenarios I'm focused on, which are the, the problematic ones, which are Biden does run for reelection 
or Biden doesn't and Kamala's the nominee, whether she just gets it handed to her or she fights for it and wins it. If you give me an even money bet today, I'm probably betting on Trump in those scenarios based on what I currently see as the energy of the Democratic Party and the energy of the Republican Party. Part of it is that even in 2020, right, there's this urgent emergency of removing Donald Trump. Uh, uh, the, en- the, the energy and enthusiasm around Biden was relatively muted. Now, Biden fortunately won by many millions of votes nationally, but it was small differences in just a few states. If they had gone the other way, Trump would have won. It's similar to Trump winning in 16. If just a few states went slightly differently, Hillary Clinton would have been uh, the winner in 2016. So that also makes me concerned with Trump four years in the rearview mirror that there will be again Democrats who, after eight years of Obama, said, "Ah, I'm not for whatever reason, I'm not going to go out and vote in this Hillary versus Trump thing. And then Trump won a repeat of that also scares me. And then in addition to that, as we see at these Trump rallies, the cult of personality around Donald Trump the fact that the Republican Party, whether they're pretending or whether they seriously like Trump, it doesn't matter. They're they're basically behind him. They're not abandoning him. That is uh, troubling. And there is really I mean, it, it really seems like there's nothing Trump can do to lose the support that he has, or at least most of it. So I think 2024 is real trouble in a rematch against Joe Biden or against Kamala Harris. I'm not saying I have a better idea. I think Trump will be very strong in 24 if he's the the, the nominee. So if you have a different perspective, I would love to hear from you. And I understand I'm breaking my own rule. I, I usually only talk about the next election, but the circumstances are unique. And the next election is 22, but it relates so much to 24 that we really have sort of like a three year period that I see as a package in my mind. So send me your thoughts about this. And of course, If 2022 goes disastrously for the Trumpian wing of the Republican Party, that weakens Trump dramatically. Um, But I don't know that that's actually going to be the outcome. So let me know how worried you are about this. If you agree, disagree, find me on Twitter at Deep Hackman. One of the big things that happened during our vacation is that the Trump organization, meaning Trump's business, Uh, and its CFO, Alan Weisselberg, were indicted on multiple criminal charges, 15 felony counts against Alan Weisselberg. Now, this is significant. The charges are serious. They involve uh, tax fraud of various kinds, including failing to report and pay taxes on a bunch of different benefits, cars, apartments, school tuition. It includes state and federal income tax fraud, state and local tax fraud more generally. The reaction from the right and from Trump's family, exactly as everybody who's been paying attention predicted, has been this is bogus, politically motivated nonsense. But of course, because they can't seem to resist Trump's children, Don Jr. and Eric Trump went on TV and basically admitted they did all the stuff. They admit to it in the context of saying this is small potatoes. They admit to it in the context of saying we're only being targeted for this for political reasons. But They admit to it, much like Trump did at his rally in Florida over the weekend. They both, uh, Don Jr. and Eric, had complete meltdowns. In this first clip, we're going to look at a Newsmax host, Eric Balling, asking Eric whether he thinks he or his siblings might be indicted. And Eric just loses his mind and starts talking about Hunter Biden, if you can believe it. Let's take a look at this. Here, Eric, are you concerned that they may send an indictment your way, your brother's way, or your sister's way? You know what? I'm not, Eric, because guess what? You know, we, we've always lived amazingly clean lives. And believe me, if they could have, they already would have. Right. There is no way that this was going on 15 years at the Trump organization and none of the Trumps knew nothing happens at the Trump organization without Trump or one of his kids knowing it. It's just not plausible. I mean, that's what they wanted. That was their end goal. You know, the difference is I'm not Hunter Biden. I'm not selling paintings to undisclosed people for half a million dollars a piece. I'm not doing you know, drug. there's no reason to believe there's anything criminal in what Hunter Biden is doing with his paintings Drugs in, in in shady hotels. I'm not I'm not going out and soliciting prostitution and I'm not going out and, you know, selling influence to Ukraine and China and having lavish trips paid for a while. You know, my, my fa- those things can all be investigated, but it's not the subject of this interview. Father's commander in chief. No, I'm not doing that. You know what we do? Don Ivanka and I re- live really you know, nice, clean lives. And we work very, very hard. And guess what? Long before politics ever came into, you know, our lives, 
we were in the business world and we were successful and we worked very mm-hmm. hard and we lived mm-hmm. clean lives. And it was very different than the Bidens who were never in business until their father actually got into politics and, and they've milked it for everything it's worth and they still do it to this day. And, you know, Eric, where is the DA there? You know, when, when you have text messages of, 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 of prostitutes. So much of what he's talking, you know, the, the, the DA, a lot of that stuff is in different jurisdictions. There are allegations, many of which have been looked into and found to be completely baseless. Uh, just melting down completely. Now, in this next clip from Fox News, Eric Trump admits these are employment perks. Everything that's alleged is true, but it simply shouldn't be a criminal matter. He's saying, you know, Eric, you don't have to do these interviews. I don't think he knows that. Yeah, well, these are employment perks. These are, you know, these are, um, you know, a, a corporate car, which everybody has. I guarantee you there's people. Who doesn't have a corporate car, guys? Come on. Well, on this network that has corporate cars, I guarantee you there's people in every company in the country that have corporate vehicles. This is what they're going after. This isn't a criminal matter. This is, you know, it's really interesting, Raymond. After the financial crisis, right? They didn't so, go So after- you see what he did there. He admitted, admitted to all of it, but he says this just it sh- isn't a criminal matter. Or what he means is it shouldn't be. That's his opinion. But he's admitting to the stuff. That's what's amazing. After a single person on Wall Street, despite the fact that these people were literally, they took down the U.S. economy, but they'll go down, they'll go after somebody after fringe employment benefits. Mm. Is that really what the DA is focused on is little girls are getting shot in the middle of Times Square? Mm. They'll go after a corporate vehicle and a corporate apartment. Give me understand that there's not a single denial here. He's admitting all of it. He's just saying they shouldn't be focused on this break. And honestly, I have to say the media has actually been very fair about this. The New York Times, um, you know, so many of the different news outlets, they've literally said this isn't this isn't criminal. This isn't worth. Well, this is the investigators and this would normally be this would normally be a civil complaint. Uh, Okay, so there there is that. And then Don Jr., um, on Fox News with uh, Dan Bongino, also admitting all of it, but just saying this shouldn't be the focus of the criminal system. Yeah, they, they, they dressed up the indictment, obviously. They dress it up. They make it look really serious. They say he didn't pay taxes on $1.7 million worth of stuff over 16 years. So that's to New York State, 8% of that, $136,000. Half of that was because my father paid for his grandchildren's school in New York City. Did you so that's one of the allegations that Donald Trump just directly paid Alan Weisselberg's uh, grandkids tuition. Uh, That has to be taxed. If I have a business lease, the amount that my business pays for my car lease, I'm I have to pay taxes on that. That is a benefit. And that's a lot less money than what we're talking about here for tuition. Don is basically saying it was over a long period of time and it's not that much money per month, but he's admitting it all. So you take that out. It amounts to about five grand a month. Oh, and that's okay. what they promised. They brought in outside prosecutors. They teamed up with the attorney general of New York State to do this. So while. Cr- so there it is not denying any of it. Their, their strategy is admit it all in plain sight, but say it shouldn't be criminal and there's prosecutorial discretion that's being applied in a politically biased way. Do they know they don't have to do these interviews and that they don't have to say these things? Or is this genuinely the only way they can think of to defend themselves to say, yeah, I mean, we kind of did it all, but none of it should be illegal, or at least it should be a civil issue, or at least they should go after somebody else. Disastrous. And they've essentially over the weekend, Don Jr., Eric and Donald Trump himself at his rally in Sarasota, they admitted to all of it. But they're saying it just really isn't that serious. Unbelievable. And we'll see if that defense works out for them. It actually may. We'll take a quick break and be back right after this. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the David Pakman show. You can watch the full hour long show. You can watch the show in shorter clips. You'll see all of our interviews and everything else from the show. You can go back and watch all of that content from past shows dating all the way back to 2009. Interact with other viewers politely in the comment section. And when you subscribe to our YouTube channel, make sure to click that bell button to be notified about every new video. Just go to youtube.com slash the David Pakman show. I'll see you there. I'm there every day.
So there's growing uh, pressure, so-called, from Republicans for Joe Biden to be screened for dementia like Donald Trump was. And this all relates to the Montreal Cognitive Assessment or the MOCA, as it's called, which Donald Trump, you might remember, took during his time uh, in the White House. And Trump hasn't stopped bragging about the results ever since, even at one point, remember, telling reporters like Chris Wallace, accusing them during an interview you couldn't do as well as me on those tests. And Trump keeps calling it a cognitive test. Trump brags about his great score and how it proves something, I guess, about his intelligence. The reality, as I've told you before, is that this test is meant to screen out serious dementia, pretty serious advanced dementia, sometimes used to evaluate patients after strokes to see what their cognitive functioning is. It's not really something to brag about. It's just a very crude and basic screening tool to find out is something really wrong here where someone has forgotten, you know, what a camel looks like. Now, you might be wondering, why is this an issue now? Again, this is present now because Trump won't stop talking about it. And Dr. Uh, Ronnie Jackson, Trump's former White House doctor, who's now a congressman, um, is saying that Joe Biden should take the test. Uh, Don Jr. is saying Joe Biden should take the test. Donald Trump has now started saying that uh, Joe Biden should take the test. But in so doing, Trump just can't control himself. He can't stop bragging about the test. Trump went down to the U.S.-Mexico border with Republican governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, and they had like a little press event. And somehow Trump gets on the topic of his dementia test and how Biden should take the test. Take a look at this. But he did a test. Did I ace it? I aced it. And I'd like to see Biden ace it. He won't ace it. He'll get the first two. There's 35 questions, and the first two or three are pretty easy. They're the animals. Is this a lion, a giraffe? When he gets to around 20, he's going to have a little hard time. I think he's going to have a hard time with the first few, actually. But uh, so we really have something. Now, Trump is just wrong about basically everything as usual. There aren't 35 questions. There are 30 points. There's really like 19 or 23 questions, depending on how you count them. So like even Trump's recollection of what the test is, is wrong, but he keeps insisting with it. But somehow Trump is obsessed with the test. Here he is talking to Sean Hannity, also at the border, part of his Mexico border propaganda tour that he did last week during our vacation. Listen to Trump and Sean Hannity helping to push this nonsense about the difficulty of the test in trouble. He with these comments. We uh, we aced it. I think I can say that I aced it. Did, did he get one? He didn't get one question wrong, did he? 30 out of 30. 30, out of 30. Yeah. Wow. I have to tell you, the crowd cheering is just something else. I mean, they're they're cheering for what is a normal state. They're cheering for not suffering from serious dementia. These are people who would clap for anything. Consider what it is they're clapping for. It's pathetic. The president passed the test meant to screen for serious cognitive impairment. Yeah. What a manly guy, our leader. Here's the rest of the clip and Trump again saying the test is just much tougher than the media will tell you. More difficult after you got by 15, I would say. But I, I heard the first three questions are, is it a giraffe or an elephant, right? Well, you know, that's what the fake news does. They take the first two or three questions yeah. and they put that and they put them in. But let me tell you, they would not get those last 15 right. Certainly not the last 10 that I can tell you. But anyway. So again, uh, Dr. Ronnie Jackson, Trump's former doctor, now just a bomb throwing congressman, also pushing this and uh, saying um, that uh, something is going on. Biden needs a test. Uh, and just to remind you about the test, by the way, this really is an easy test. Um, we've got it up on the screen. I mean, it's, you know, stuff like draw a clock that shows that it's 1110, identify a lion, a rhino and a camel. Remember, repeat back to me the words face velvet church daisy red read a list of digits and then, you know, you count them back like the, the, the tester would say two, one, eight, five, four. And you have to say two, one, eight, five, four or repeat the numbers backwards, seven, four, two. And you say two, four, seven, um, subtract by seven out loud, you know, like one hundred ninety three, eighty six, seventy nine. This is the test um, when Trump says there are tougher questions. 
you know, there's one called abstraction, which is like, what are the similarities between train and bicycle to which you would say, oh, sir, those are methods of transportation or, uh, you know, things Republicans oppose, <laughs> depending on your, your perspective, a watch and a ruler. Well, both of those help you measure different things. The watch measures time and the ruler measures length. This is what they're t this is the difficult test that Trump is talking about. So it's all pathetic. Um, it seems to be another distraction narrative, quite frankly. And it is bizarre that Donald Trump is still obsessed with it. Real quick, uh, I want to mention that there was a, a bizarre and horrifying event in Philadelphia that kind of went wacky. Um, white supremacists participated in a rally, a march in Philadelphia uh, meant to be about supposed election integrity, by which they mean that Trump really won. Check out this report from HuffPost. A white supremacist group based in Texas attempted a march on Philadelphia over the uh, Independence Day weekend, but had to celebrate the holiday the Confederate way. They literally ran away from the people of Philadelphia. Michael Crum, a police officer in the city, told the local ABC station WPVI about 200 masked and khaki clad members of the Patriot Front organization listed as a white nationalist hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center marched on the city in the Saturday night incident. NBC Philadelphia reported they chanted about the election and reclaim America, engaged in pushing and shoving with people and took a reporter's cell phone. But that boldness quickly faded as more residents turned out. They started engaging with citizens of Philadelphia who were none too happy about what they were saying. These males felt threatened. And at one point, somebody in their crowd threw a type of smoke bomb to cover their retreat. They're, they're treating this like a tactical event. They covered their retreat. Philly Mayor Jim Kenney said he was appalled that the group chose his city for its demonstration, saying, while we respect everyone's right to exercise free speech, our administration stands against everything these groups represent. Racism, intolerance and hate have no place here. There are videos of white supremacist groups uh, using what look to be toy shields to protect themselves. It's all just absolutely and completely bizarre. One member of the white supremacist group was hit and fell when another member pulled the truck's roll up door down, slamming him in the head in the process. I'm not going to play the clip, but it is there. Uh, there were no arrests, nor were there reports of injuries or damage. So, of course, I I'm not for violence of any kind. I'm not for violence by the protesters. And assuming that it is not in self-defense, I'm also not for violence against these people. A couple interesting notes here. Number one. It's great that this went a different way than Charlottesville, Virginia, early in Donald Trump's presidency. Of course, you never want to see that. Number two, it's not lost on me that the people that are clinging on to the Trump really one narrative include all sorts of uh, 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 of radicals, including in this case, white nationalists. And it's good that uh, the government is paying attention to the, to the fact that that's a reality. Um, and then number three, again, uh, does it matter whether the white nationalists really think Trump won or whether they are just using it as an excuse to get out there and cause chaos? It doesn't really matter much the same way that there's people who say Trump's anti-Semitic. And then the counter is Trump's not anti-Semitic. His son in law is Jewish. His daughter converted to Judaism. His grandkids are Jewish. Oh, but you could still have Jewish family and be anti. It doesn't matter if he emboldens and coalesces the anti-Semitic people and the white nationalists. What is deep in Trump's mind doesn't actually really matter. The actions are what matter here. And the actions in this particular case are that all sorts of radicals are getting involved in this. I, I hate I feel stupid even calling it election integrity movement. It's really a wreak havoc and try to steal the election movement. Uh, all of those groups are getting involved and we'll see what impact they have uh, on the 2022 election, quite frankly. We have a voicemail number you can call anytime. We had hundreds and hundreds of voicemails waiting for us when we got back from our uh, vacation. Let's listen to one who is pointing out, you know, David, these live streams are getting so crazy that it's almost impossible to even use the chat function. I, there's something funny and quaint about this one. Take a listen. Hey, David, I just wanted to say I apologize if I'm. Anyway, I'll just say it. Um, can you make some, some sort of statement for your um, live shows about the live chat? Because people 
just speed through and there's a hundred statements and you can't even read it. It's like, right. there's no interaction at all. It's just <laughs> blah, it's like word salad. Just well, well, word salads should be the motto for YouTube live stream chat. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree. Flying at a hundred miles an hour. So there's no conversation. Like, no, I wish YouTube had like a, uh, you know, you could only make a statement maybe every five seconds. It's called slow mode. We use it. Uh, we have it turned on. It's actually set to 10 seconds, but it's just, it. they get crazy. I admit it. Or something like that. But it's just insane. Like, it, there's, it, you might as well not even have it turned on. <laughs> there's something so quaint and delightful about, you know, during these, when the, when the stream has a lot of people watching it, the live chat is almost completely worthless and unusable, and and it's unclear whether it should even be on. I completely agree with you. Yeah, that's why I don't even look at it. Uh, and maybe you shouldn't either, but I, I just love that. It's like, welcome to the internet, my friend. Yeah, that's how it works. No, but we do use slow mode. We could slow it down even more. We could set it to 30 seconds, but sometimes people get frustrated. We, we, want, we want the chat to be available to people who want it, much like YouTube comments, but it's also easy to ignore it and them. Uh, the live chat and comments, uh, respectively, if you just want to focus on the content. So my view is something for everyone. Have everything turned on, but only use what you like. Today's bonus show, I will tell you wacky anti-vax stories from my vacation in Florida. Some of the things happened in Florida. Some of the things happened in Florida. And you'll know which or which as I explain it to you on today's bonus show. Uh, get instant access by becoming a member at joinpacman.com. We'll hear about what Pat was up to. It'll be great, and I'll speak to you then. <laughs>